So the name of this is Bake Until It's Microsoft. Um, I don't know. I guess we're close to some site. Some site. We have to hack this controller. So we thought um, Marvin and I cooked up this little recipe. We hope it doesn't leave a bad taste in your mouth. But I think it kind of sums things up. As Mark talked about, we did uh, make sure that the computer was C2 config. It had Service Pack 3 on it and the virus scanners. And uh, we still found it to be pretty soft and gooey. Objectives for the presentation, I'd like to present a background. Actually, Mark has done that, so I won't need to do that for you. Uh, talk a little bit about the requirements and erosion of the trusted computing base. Uh, we're going to present, or at least I am, Mark will jump in if he feels like it, present uh, our findings over the past year of the registry and the problems we're seeing there. And also, uh, we're going to talk about Word 97, structured storage and introduction, attack method requirements. This is a methods. These are requirements that you would need as an attacker to take advantage of the problems that I'm going to be talking about. And concluding remarks. Feel free to ask questions anytime. As I, I understand we have two hours here. I don't know how long the talk's going to be, so um, I'm pretty free form in that regard. I have two goals for the lecture. Uh, one is technology transfer. And again, that's why I encourage questions and comments. So uh, I'd like to try and, and have you going away knowing a little bit more about NT. We also want to increase the security awareness of post C2 compliant NT. The only NT product that was ever compliant with C2 or got that level of accreditation was 3.5. And I think it's easy to get into this, uh, it's kind of a marketing scheme, I don't know. You see that uh, NT4.0 is it's newer than NT3.5, it's got a better interface, it's got a higher version number, so it must be uh, good, as good or better, right? And I think that they're kind of they went out and got this C2 uh, compliance, which, by the way, was not accredited for network connectivity. It was standalone. This is NT2. And now we have NT4, which has got performance improvements, GUI improvements, compatibility improvements, and all of these things, in order to make them really work well and efficiently, are being crammed into the kernel. So now we have a bloated kernel that has more lines of code. I think, what did you say, about 5 million? Um, 7 million, more, 7 million lines, yeah. more lines of code. It's just a plain, simple statistic. So there's going to be problems in that kernel. Well, putting it another way, the 7 million lines of code that was added is 10 times as much code as there was in the evaluated B2 Multics DCB. In terms of background, I just wanted to present a little of my background. I was attacked. I did a vulnerability research at the agency, NSA, and uh, field evaluations, attack development, and house training. And during that time, it was pretty much all the command and control places that we went to were using Solaris or Unix. And NT really wasn't that big, except for in the Air Force. And so a lot of my background has been from the Unix perspective. And when I came and started this project, I really had no NT experience whatsoever. So this was good and bad. I mean, it was good because I was not tainted by the Microsoft wheel so to speak. 
And so when I did things, I, I didn't do them in the Microsoft way. And I think that helped me to, to discover some of these uh, things that we'll be discussing. It was bad, you know, in the sense that we were doing research and I had a steep learning curve to figure out how NT really worked. Uh, it's a lot different, in my opinion, than a Unix kernel. I think it's useful to talk about, to put this uh, lecture in the context of a TCB and the requirements. For the TCB, we have basically three things that you need. You need isolation, completeness, and correctness. Isolation in the sense that uh, the TCB needs to be protected. Completeness in the sense that the TCB mediates all access to and from it. And correctness in the fact that uh, there needs to be a written policy. The TCB must necessarily meet that policy of enforcement. What we're finding, though, is that we're finding examples in our research that it doesn't. And so that causes us to probe further and ask questions, well, why doesn't it? How is this working? What was the assumptions made when it was designed? For example, uh, why does it take administrator privilege to load MSDN library viewer? It's just a dumb viewer program. But you've got to install with admin. I think you've got to reboot after you do it. And from a Unix perspective, this was just totally unheard of. You know, you, you want to install some program, you log into your directory, you download the file, you unzipped it, you, you put it in, and you were up and running. It had no effect on the rest of the system. My partial uh, belief is that this is just an extension of the personal PC computer days. You know, this is one PC, it was designed for one person to work on at a time. So why should there be more than one copy of the software? Except in this case, it has to be installed with, with access to the TCB and privileges so that uh, it's installed in the system directories and whatnot. We consistently see examples of developer delusions. About, I don't know, two months ago, I had to write a, a program on a FreeBSD system. And at first I started out and I said, well, I want this to be a command line interface. Because that's the way I'm going to use it. I want a, a very uh, you know, the old way. I like the old way. So I wrote this program, and it was about two pages long, and about half of that was my attempt at making sure there was only four command line arguments, and all the command line arguments were properly checked for bounds and limitations and, and proper format. And then about a week or two later, somebody said, well, this would be a really neat tool, but oh, I wish I had a GUI. So I went back and I thought about it and I decided to put a GUI wrapper around this program. And as I was doing it, I got to the point where I knew there was only going to be four arguments. So I put four boxes on the screen. And I said to myself, well, the person who invokes the GUI can only enter four values. So I'm always going to call the command line version of this the same way. And it struck me that that was maybe what's going on with some of the Microsoft uh, layers and layers of order. You have a wrapper around some application which maybe or maybe does not have rigid methods for interrogating command line arguments or the arguments presented to an API or whatever. So I think uh, the, the advent of GUI programming has led to delusions. It's led to the programmers making false assumptions or incorrect assumptions or <coughs> incomplete. Uh, a couple of the, well, the other point there is that 
you know, maybe this is just a guess, but maybe Microsoft programmers feel that, you know, only solution providers, i.e. certified MSE companies, are going to be using the API. The set of APIs that are available on MP. But that's not true. All those hackers, anybody who has something they want to get done, uh, now with the advent of Office and VBA for all the applications, you can actually call APIs from macros. Uh, there's two examples. We're going to get into the registry editing policy a little bit later. But one example of erosion here is with the TCB, or I mean with file associations. If you see a file in the extension is .doc, what is it? Word. Word? Is it anything else? Could be WordPad. I mean, that's a defined type of DLC. But uh, in reality, it could be anything. <coughs> and so what happens in the registry when you double click a file, you see the extension, it goes into H key classes root, which is one of the main keys, and it looks up the extension, and from there it gets a file type. And so for DLC, the default file type is Word document. And if you're out running Office 95, then it's Word document dot six. If you're running Office 98, 97, I'm sorry, it's word.document.8. And then inside of that key, there's a set of commands and methods that cause that document to be involved. So there are a lot of these examples. Uh, if you're an Internet Explorer and you click on a web page that happens to be a Word document, it may not say it on the hyperlink, but IE will automatically launch that document unless you set it up not to. The same is true for things like .exe, .reg. .reg is a registry entry file. When you double click on that, it automatically loads changes into the registry. Well, yes, Mark has aptly stated uh, we've done some experiments in playing around with file associations. And so uh, one of the experiments that we did was to go in and uh, change the binding for .exe. Uh, we also happen to do this for .link, L-N-K, which is a, an association you never see. All you see on your screen is uh, an icon that has a little arrow on it, and that's supposed to represent a shortcut. But you can actually go into the registry and play with these things and get them. So one of our uh, objectives was to make a .dot file look like a .doc file. It really wasn't that hard. We went in, we looked at the .dot file, and inside the registry key there was a variable for uh, the default icon. And so we went out, we renamed the file, and then we had this registry key that had the icon looking just like a regular document. And so now when you use double click, it was actually loading a template as opposed to a document. The registry set of calls is contained in, as far as I know, the library I mentioned there, ADV Advanced API 32. Uh, you can find the function prototypes in winreg.h. And there are the normal set of things that you can do. The registry is kind of like a file system in that uh, there, there are keys and values. And the keys are like your directories and the values are like your files. And so you can do open, enumerate, create, modify. Uh, interesting a lot, interestingly enough, there is no move.
Another thing about the registry is it has, uh, it, the things that comprise the re registry are called hives. And there are system hives and user hives. And a hive is just basically a tree in the registry. And in particular, I want to focus on the hive called ntuser.dat. Now this hive is a, called a user hive. If you have an NT account, it is in your profiles directory. Uh, you own it, but you don't always have access to it. It's not a direct path type of access. So when you're logged into the system, what we believe is going on at this point is that the file is protected by an administrative share, which prevents you from doing things like making a copy or editing it through, say, uh, hex tools. Now, Microsoft has struggled really hard to force you into um, <coughs> editing the registry through their interface. RegEdit, RegEdit 32, the user policy, uh, user admin, all those tools. They want you to go through their API. But what they're not advertising is, uh, and again, this points to the erosion of TCB, that there are, there are places along this uh, chain of access that somebody can kind of get in this up. So we haven't actually figured out yet how to access this hive while you're logged in. But we know what you can do if you get access to it because we've structured experiments where we make a copy of the hive, we do something to it, and we put it back. When you're logged out, of course, it's protected by the file system. And the file system could be for NT, uh, FAT or NTFS. FAT has no protection means. Other than share. Other than share. So uh, if you're running FAT and NT, I would suggest that you stop. <laughs> Experiment that we did was we had two accounts, Plebe and Geek. And <clears throat> Plebe logged out and Geek logged in, and we had a FAT file system. And so what we did was um, Geek, or, yeah, Geek decided he was going to make a copy of Plebe's hive and, and edit it. So he went into the profiles directory. He went into there and he got a copy of ntuser.dat. He took it off the system. He went to another system where he had admin. And he loaded it through the Microsoft interface and made changes to it and then put it back. Well, Plebe was no more the wise. In fact, uh, if it had been the administrator account, he would have been no more than one. Okay, within the, the hive itself, <coughs> there are ACLs. And these ACLs can be set such that the owner of the file, Plebe or Geek in this case, cannot change certain values <coughs> within the hive. Now, to me, that, sound, that, that seems like a pretty good idea, but when I started thinking about it, it's like, wait a second. At the file system level, I own this file. It's mine. At the registry API level, it's owned by, some of the keys are owned by the administrator. Like, there's got to be a, there's a, there's a, there's a miss there. There's a paradigm. And so at that point, it struck me to try and discover all the ways that I can gain access to the file into user.dat without going through the API. And so there's a few ways. I mean, you could boot to another OS, make a copy of it. Uh, maybe you can log in as another user. Uh, if it's a FAT system, we've already covered that. You've got access to it because there's no protection in FAT. Maybe there's a tool out there that allows you to edit it through another means. But clearly, I think it's a, it's a, it's a place that may be fertile for um, Vulnerabilities, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. There's one, there's one piece of it which is very important. And, and like I said, there's all these different ways that we've hypothesized that people may be able to get to it. So out of band access is a problem. 
NTUs or DIDAT as a TCB element is not isolated. Another question that we wanted to answer up front, because as soon as we started digging into the registry, we thought, boy, this is just really a big problem. So one of our uh, objectives was to determine countermeasures. So we decided to brainstorm and think of, well, ask the questions, how do you disable registry access? Well, for remotely, you disable, you have to set a key called WinReg. And let's see, do I have it over here? Yeah, I'll put it up, the screen up a little bit later, but I have the key here on the board. Now, it, it exists in NT server by default, but it doesn't exist in workstation. And the thing about this key is if it's there, the ACL on the key, the access control list for the key, determines access to the registry remotely. So if the uh, user guest is allowed all full access, then anybody with a guest account can log in and modify your registry. I think this is how the red button attack works. If you don't know about red button, go out to uh, I think it's NT security or assist internal NT bug tracking. NT bug track. Once you actually get access remotely, though, the ACLs on all the keys within the registry control access to the values still. So those that access is still mediated. But that brings up another point. I mean, when we first started looking at this, we ran a tool called C2Config comes in the NT resource kit. And again, we got this impression, like if we ran this tool, the machine would be all set up for C2 access. Well, not really. And we ran the tool, and we then went into the registry and started poking around, and we found that we could still edit things, important things, things like file associations. And so, and that was as, again, cleave or key. We also asked the question, how do you prevent uh, registry manipulation locally? The answer to that was, uh, you have to set a policy. Well, guess where the policy is stored? Every user is um, unique. So you have two choices. You store it somewhere in a system hive, or you store it in the user hive. So here we go. You have a policy. The policy says this user can't edit the registry, but it's in his hive. Who owns the hive? He does. See why we want to get to it from out of band access? If I can get to that key throughout without using the API channel, then I can go in and say, well, well I really want to edit the, uh, the registry. So I'm going to set this policy back to whatever it's supposed to be or whatever it doesn't need to be to prevent me from getting an access. Another thing about the policy is uh, it just doesn't restrict API. All it does is restrict well-formed programs. A well-formed program is a program that checks another key. It's actually set up to check the key in your hive to see whether or not it's supposed to run. That one's worth saying a little bit about. Again, more on uh, registry access. There are keys and there are values. Keys can be controlled through ACLs, but values cannot. This is an example of incompleteness. Why would Microsoft go all the way to the level of keys to protect, but not the values. I have a perfect example of where this becomes really kind of troublesome. In uh, Microsoft Word, there's enable
enable macro virus protection variable. And this key determines whether or not your word will warn you whether the document has macros in it. But this key or this value, enable macro virus protection, is also in a, in a key which contains yep, uh, auto spell check, um, when to save, how often to save, update. And so if you set an apple on the key, which prevents the user from changing the value enable macro virus detection, then you also necessarily block them from changing when the spell check is run, when the files save, when updates are made. So that's kind of the inconvenience factor for the user. It's not acceptable. The problem is they just didn't do a complete design. They should have gone all the way to the, the most granular level of control that they could have. But for some reason, they didn't. Marv has a few words. Yeah, I'd like to just throw a little bit of perspective on at this point before Clayton goes into some detail. Uh, the first thing is to note the inconsistencies in the philosophy of protection itself, many of which result from the shift at some point from being basically a command line interface rehash of VMS with a little bit of mock chromium, as is noted in Helen uh, Custer's book, Inside Windows MT, to the GUI interface that's present now. Uh, one place where you see that problem is um, what it is that controls access to the registry itself one more time. On the one hand, all of the books say the way you get to the registry is by using either regedit or regedt32. And indeed, if the hive is set to specify that the user shouldn't have access to these particular registries, what happens is regedit comes up, checks the variable, and decides, oh, is this user? The answer is no. Therefore, no. You can't do that. It's flashed on the screen, and the process does. On the other hand, if the user knows about the API calls he can make to access the registry, he can do everything he wants with nothing standing between him and the values as long as the ACL doesn't preclude his getting access. That's inconsistent protection. And it's an inconsistent policy. The problem with the model is some of the time, the real TCB that came with the system is invoked. Other times, individual programs are invoked. Different teams couldn't decide what to do. Uh, the problem with the file associations, the uh, .exe, .doc, and so forth, is each of those results when a double click is performed or when a command line interface call is performed or an explorer call is performed in calling up the program that has been associated with the suffix to open the file in question. If one goes through and changes the .exe association to be trojanhorse.flute Trojan Horse will come up and open the file, do whatever it wants to do before turning control over to that program by finally calling the loader that was associated by Microsoft with .exe. At no point does the registry have enough sense to determine, oh, this is an executable program. These aren't supposed to be changed. These other two the types are. Where you get bad puns is sometimes you will find the file, you'll change its association to .doc, and you'll notice that Explorer or something else in the interface comes up and says, making this change may result in surprising uh, consequences. It's always nice to note those things. They're hints to the interloper. Um, the first level of type checking is based upon that three-level suffix. From that point on, if the three-level suffix matches for opening the file, the first-level type check has been passed, and it's up to the application to defend itself. If what's loaded isn't really of the data type, the question is where and if 
the application checks to find out what it's about to read before the attack may have already culminated. And so the second observation is that though the Custer book and others claim that the system is based on the principles of type checking and type enforcement that are associated with Carnegie Mellon Ma, in reality, the designers and the evolvers who threw in the GUI have made a mockery of that particular claim. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is just reiteration now, but there's a tool called RegEdit. And RegEdit, the Windows program, complies with the policy. RegEdit, the command line interface, does not. And this is just a small little program. But you know what? They're the same. <laughs> and uh, so that really raises this question that Mark was talking about. So here's a validation experiment you can run. Set this key. This is H key current user. I abbreviated that. Uh, set the key software Microsoft Windows current version policy system. You may have to create the key system. Add the following key. Note that it is a D word. And here's another part where semantics uh, seem to be lacking with the registry. Uh, in some cases, applications put in a value called 1, and it's a string. In other cases, they put in a value called one, and it's a D word, double word. That's a lack of semantics. And the problem here is, today, only one program may read that value. But tomorrow, there may be 10 other tools which are competing for the user's interest, and they may want to read that same value. And unless they make the same assumptions that the original author did, or they know the, the intrinsics of the, the value they're going to have from. So after you set this up, you need to invoke RegEdit, uh, the Windows program, and see what happens. And you should get an error message saying you're not allowed to edit the registry. <coughs> and now if you run this one, which is a command line version with a switch, it says extract to this file H key current user. Uh, you can specify any tree that you'd like, as long as it's complete and exists. And what will happen is you'll get back a file that has the registry keys listed in them. It'll be a text file. And you can look at it with a text editor. Does anybody need to see that any longer? I'm sorry. So what we're getting here, what we're getting to is that uh, looks like the registry is turning into a dumpster. And uh, it lacks semantics. It's extensible without discipline. That means, uh, you know, if you build a software application and you need to register a class ID or you need to do something that needs to go in the registry, then um, all you need to do is create your keys, put them in there, and uh, now you're registered. One of the things that I've been obser observing lately is uh, you can go out to the web <coughs> and download trial software. This is a full version copy. And it's only good for 14 days. Well, uh, one particular case, I downloaded the software. I was playing around with it. A couple days later, it's like the clock's ticking down. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to buy it, so I said, well, what's causing this thing to tick down? And so I started looking around for files that had uh, dates in them or counters or something like this, and finally got around to looking at the registry. And so what I went, what I went to do was, in the registry, you have a section for software vendors. It's under the software key. It would be software, and maybe it's like... Uh, Zip or something, or whatever the vendor is. I mean, one of the major vendors, of course, there's 
Microsoft, but say uh, New Mega Technologies, they make uh, debuggers and things. So I went under this key and I was looking for things that would point me in the direction of how the counter was working. Well, I couldn't find anything. It's like, how are these guys doing it? Did they modify the binary? So then I decided to run this program called RegMod. And you can get it off of uh, www.sysinternals.com. And it's available with source, so it's a pretty good deal. Uh, you get the tool, and it allows you to monitor all registry access for program that you specify. So I started monitoring this. And the next thing I see is there's keys being opened, and it's reading keys, and it's checking keys, and all this and that. And then I see it opens this key, which is totally in a whole different neighborhood of the registry. So I went in and looked at it, and it was like, you know the tips you get when you first log in in NT? Brand new user, you get these tips on the screen. It's like, uh, you know, you can right click your mouse, and that'll get you, you know, that. Well, in this directory of all these tips, I see all the tips listed out, <coughs> and I see two little values. They had weird names like OLE date or OLE automation. It turns out that these two values were encrypted date of when I installed the program. So this particular vendor, he didn't follow the guidelines of creating his own little fiefdom in the registry. He actually went outside of it to hide this value. Another thing about uh, the registry, why I think it's a dumpster, is because a lot of times you remove software through the add remove software tool, which is supposed to remove it and get rid of it. Well, a lot of times you go into the registry and you still got the keys. That's dangerous. It's dangerous because, uh, for example, um, you run the C2 config utility, and one of the things you're supposed to do is remove POSIX. Well, all that does, really, is delete the POSIX.exe program. It doesn't delete the keys in the registry, which invoke it. So if some user comes back in and they copy POSIX back into the right spot, all of a sudden POSIX is back in enable on your system. <coughs> we also believe that there's a race condition that we haven't figured out how to exploit yet, but there's an ACL list and an ACL list. And every time you want to access an object, you have to go, the kernel goes through these lists. And you may be on all the access lists in the world, but if you're on a single NACL, you're denied. So the question there is, well, what's the order of events? What's the checking? Can I cause the program that's checking or the routine that's checking to do a slight diversion? Or can I put enough load on the system that uh, it will cause a favorable event to occur for me? And again, this is just reiteration of Marv's point. There's paradigms here. Some of the programs are doing the checking. Sometimes the kernel's doing the checking. Sometimes they're both doing it. Sometimes none of them are doing it. Sometimes you really do get a mix of all three of the first ones. OK, word 97. Let's take a 10-minute break. And we'll resume at 4. We go to 5, right? Yes, we have a question. 
I was just wondering if uh, what Microsoft said about these things that you say are safe. Nothing. Well, uh, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a long story, but uh, when we started, there was a sort of cooperative relationship between us and Microsoft because we weren't finding anything that was bad. Uh, they were also um, telling us that, gee, we do have to work out a way to get you information on the structure and internals of the system if we can figure out how to do that which they still haven't done. But they were willing to listen to questions we came up with and findings we had and answer a few. Then one day Clayton applied transitivity to an advertiser's property of the system and came up with a flaw that is insidious, deep, pervasive, and um, we had no idea how to fix it either. And on the first three cogent restatements of what the problem was, uh, the person we were dealing with correctly guessed each of the things we tried before we hit on what we had hit on and said, but, you know, anyone could do that. No, 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 that's not what we did. We did this. Oh, but anyone could do this other thing. No, 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 that's not what we did. We did this. Then there was the pregnant pause, the oh shit, the pregnant pause, and the so how do we fix it? Gee, guys, we don't know. We don't have access to the internals. Uh, and we haven't had any successful interchanges since then. Um, since then, we left that rather simple, primitive, and naive gotcha and got to some fairly deep ones, which we think are going to be much harder for anyone to fix. Um, there are two principal problems and then I'm going to sit down, that underlie what is happening. Uh, one is the group that designed the office applications has very little relationship to the group that did NT security or the add-on of the Windows 95 shell. And as a result, um, there are requirements called for in Office 97 in particular that are inconsistent with what happens deep in the bowels of uh, NT security. Something had to break, and the thing that broke was least privilege. As a consequence, Office 97 cannot be installed on NT without admin privilege. As a result of installing it, the C2 configuration that we would like to have is deliberately modified. Permissions are set for various uh, directories that you would normally not want to give everyone access to. And uh, that's a fairly significant breach. Uh, by the way, on MT, if you want to install the introduction to MT, getting to learn how to use it application, you can't install that without being an uh, administrator either which means the person who doesn't know what security is or how to protect himself has to become administrator on the system before he can learn how to use it. Uh, the second principle after least privilege that is a serious problem that enables all of the attacks that Clayton is going to go through is that the security policy gives the user a specific set of privileges. The borrowed programs uh, that come with the applications and the active documents and other things that you'll be seeing act with that user's pro uh, privileges. There isn't any way of diminishing privilege while they're executed. And so as a result, if the user has the ability and set of privileges to mess up the system and the Trojan horse that's installed in the macro, can figure out which user is running and which privileges he has, and the answer to both of those is yes, then the attack can be sprung one way, and in other cases, it can simply place itself into a form of storage so that maybe the administrator will find it later. And so attacks generally make use of the fine grain of uh, access control that goes with, you know, with user rights but there's no way to further diminish the privilege during the execution, and that turns out to be a gotcha.
sit down. Microsoft is being quiet. No one speaks for Microsoft authoritatively at this point. Word just because it is uh, very pervasive. Uh, and the first thing we went to was, of course, macros. Everybody's interested in macro attacks, macro viruses. And um, so we just started playing around. And there is a difference between 95 and 97 Word. Uh, 95 uses visual Word, ba uses Word basic. And 97 uses Visual Basic, VBA. So what they've done is they had Access, they had Excel, they had Word, and they all had their own little macro language. And now in 97, you see a unified approach, VBA to macros. This means macros report across applications. Uh, office automation was in there already. And they port across platforms. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you, anything you want to do in these, as a user, as a typer or document writer, you can do with macros. Anything. Furthermore, uh, you can take macros and you can replace predefined functions that are within the applications. So. If you do file open, well, that can be replaced with a macro called file open. All you have to do is call it the same thing. Um, that's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, on the one hand, you have a very high degree of control. On the other hand, you have uh, a weapon that can be used to totally spoof you. I'm doing a file open, or I'm doing a print. That can't be bad. Wrong. Um, VBA can invoke API. So it's not just a macro language. You know, it's, it's not a toy anymore. You can actually invoke system API calls, calls to edit the registry, calls to open files, calls to uh, reboot the system. So it's a full-fledged programming language. You have access to all of the wealth of the OS in terms of APIs. The only thing you have to do is know how to define those within your macro. There is no external compiler required. So this is better than the Unix days when you know every system came with CC. And you just download your files, compile them, and run your attack. I personally categorize in macros, I don't know if this is official or, I mean, this is just my convention, but I see two categories of macros. I see normal macros and event-driven macros. And normal macros are the things that most people see and deal with. They're macros that you get when you go tools, uh, tools, macros, or whatever. Event-driven macros are kind of off to the side. You have to kind of know about VBA and the fact that they even exist to use them. But <coughs> event-driven macros can be subdivided two, two more times to document events and ActiveX controls. So you can actually put uh, buttons and, and objects in your Word document that can be bound to macros that are executed on things like mouse move, focus, click, And the document events, there's three predefined document events. There's a document open, document new, and a document close. These events run without intervention. So if they're there and macro virus protection is disabled, that's it. You can't stop them, except for one case. And you have to be tricky. It's a, it's a timing thing. 
But if you hold down the shift key while you're opening the document, then in theory, macros are disabled. But timing is everything. Especially for this document events. Uh, actually, uh, we built a we, we built a a document. It was a blank document, and then I put a big square in there that was clear. And I said we had about ten different people open a document and edit. Well, the square was an active X control, and it was activated on a mouse move. Mouse move. So as soon as the person did anything, the macros ran and it was all over. So there's a key in the registry. You can search on it. Uh, case isn't really important. It's that old DOS thing. And so you'll see keys sometimes will be up to case for case mix. Uh, if this value is set to 1, then you have the detection on. If it's set to 0, then it's disabled. And any document you open will not undergo the scrutiny of macrovirus detection. This was the first thing that we looked at. It was an easy target and it's an easy check. It's either on or off. The startup tab. Uh, things that are in the startup directory are automatically loaded into Word. And these include add-ons, WLLs, and templates. Things in the startup directory are not required to undergo macrovirus detection. So if your startup path is defined and it's writable by other people, you've got a problem. And again, we talk about this single user mentality. When you install Office, it goes into a single directory on the system, and the system templates and startup path are pointing to that directory. Well, guess what? Everybody has access. It's an easy target, it's a moderate check. It's a moderate check in that you can't just look at the path and say this is good or bad. You have to look at the path and the contents. Clayton? Yes? What's a macro virus? How does the system know one when it sees it? OK, he asked the question, how, what is a macro virus, and how does the system know when it sees one? Is that correct? OK. So if you take the textbook definition of a, mac, of, of a virus, it's something that can replicate and attach and go and attach itself to additional documents and keep spreading. So that's your, your, your classic definition of the, mac, of the virus. The fact that it's a macro just means that it was written in one of these macro languages. So a typical scenario would be, you know, um, <coughs> Auto open or document open. A macro runs in an auto open and it searches the file system for all .doc files, gets a list, and attaches itself to each one of them. Then, when each one of those, you know, and it just eventually keeps on spreading. Now, how does the system detect it? Well, we're still working on that. Uh, we know a few things. Um, we know, for example, that your current Virus scanners, McAfee, Norton, IBM. All they can see or detect is what has been out there before. Okay? They are they're always one day, a dollar, day late, dollar short type of thing. So if there's a new virus that shows up, or even if there's a, a morphing of an old virus, or an evolution of an old virus, uh, the new, all the virus scanners will be behind. They won't see it. Now, Word and Office itself has a protection scheme. It's the all or nothing scheme. And 
What they do is they interrogate the document and they look for macros within the document. If macros exist, then you get a warning banner. And the warning banner allows you to open it, disable macros, or enable macros. And so it's up to you to decide whether or not the contents of the macros are, uh, use or are useful or good. And that check is controlled through this it's user controllable through that. It's not that value right there is not a global value. So it's not like this system either does or does not check. It's each individual user. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit more to throw in. Um, one piece of it is Edsker Dijkstra's fallacy of naming a variable uh, hopefully and therefore making your hopes come true. Uh, calling it enable macro virus protection makes you conclude that it's going to have something to do with virus protection. It doesn't. What it does is it checks to see whether there is a macro present in the thing that is being loaded. And if something shows up in the area where macros are supposed to be, it warns the user that this object contains macros. Do you want to load it or not? Uh, the second thing is it has the ability to stop two specific forms of macro from immediately executing. Those are auto-open and auto-exec macros. Uh, if you tell it not to enable the document, then those won't execute on loading. But that's all it does. And as you will see very soon, that's not related to the problem. By the way, I call these things environment variables. Uh, the macro virus detection, the startup path, uh, this one here, the templates path. I call these environment variables because of my Unix background. These are things that you can set and they control how your environment, environment looks and feels. So that's what I called them when I started this work and that's what I continue to call them. Anyway, they're stored in your hive in the registry. And the user templates is where you get normal dot dot and anything that comes with Office. And by default, it's defined. Um, I have it here on the board. Again, I'll pull that up later. But it's defined by default to be C colon program files, Microsoft Office, da 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 template. There's another set of templates that we didn't know about when we first started this, and that's called the workgroup templates. And those are for, they're not defined by default. But as we found out, they're just as powerful as the, the user templates. Um, so there was a two problem, there was one problem, one major problem here. And it's called the inheritance problem. Part A is when you load Microsoft Office, it sets up its registry keys in, in an HD local machine. And everything's set there and it's kind of like a template. Then when the first user, when any user goes to start Word or Office for the first time, it looks in this key and it pulls everything that's in that key into your hive. And so there's a precedence. If the keys are in HT local machine and the same keys are in HT current user, then the ones in your account in your HT current user take precedence. So one of the first attacks that we did was to go into this key because it was editable as a user and target somebody who had never logged in and ran office. And what we would do is we'd go in there and we would set the templates path to say C colon backslash. And that brings me to the second part of this uh, inheritance problem. Now this was something that uh, just kind of popped out at me. But I was playing around with the templates path and I was trying to do the old Unix tricks of making links, links to the templates directory or links from the template directory and to see if I could get a document to 
bypass the macro virus detection. Because, like I said, start up and template the files in those two directories are exempt from this detection. So obviously what you want to do is you want to put your stuff in there and then uh, have people open it. One way to do that is to put a file in the templates directory and create a link somewhere else in the file system. And tell the user to open that file. And then that's where you add in the thing, well, how do I get a dot .dot to look like a dot .doc? But what we found out was, hey, you know what? If we set the variable to C colon backslash, everything in the whole system is a template. Everything. That means the template sitting in your profiles directory that you just downloaded off of the internet is now considered to be a template. And when you open the file, it is exempt from macrovirus detection. So then we hit our first problem. We had C2 config our system. So when that happens, C colon backslash is set up so that the users can't write to it. The ACLs are turned off. And uh, so we thought, well, that's a problem. And well, the problem was that we went to save the document or close our Word session. And we got this error. It was like, you can't create normal dot dot. Well, why not? Well, because it's trying to create it in C colon backslash. Experiment you can try is go into your system, delete normal dot dot, start Word again, and exit, and you'll have another normal dot dot sitting in your system. Word feels it's necessary to create this font. He knows how to do it. So I was trying to do it when I set this to C colon backslash. Well, I got an error because I couldn't write to that directory as, as plead. So then we look around a little bit more and we find the work group templates. Well, that wasn't defined by default. So we set that to C colon backslash. Well, guess what? The same problem. But this time when I closed Word, it didn't give me a warning saying you couldn't create a normal uh, dot dot. So here's the trick. You, you go in, and let's say you want to target somebody. You could go into HP Local Machine, set the templates path to C colon backslash, and say, hey, Bill, I got this new document. Why don't you take a look at it? Guy logs in to your workstation. He's never logged in there before. His environment's getting set up. As it's getting set up, the keys are pulled from HP Local Machine to HP Current User. And we've already defined the templates path to be C colon backslash. So now this person has basically posed for that system. One brief uh, annotation and caveat. This is the first semi-public forum we've ever talked about these vulnerabilities in. Uh, the problem with SQL and backslash is the problem that caused Microsoft to stop talking to us. Uh, we've chosen not to publish it on the front page of USA Today or uh, the Wall Street Journal as the people in Princeton have done with Java. But uh, please be discreet about these. They're not published, not public knowledge, and our sponsors would prefer that they not become public knowledge. Uh, again, this is an easy target now, well, once you know about it, right? It's an easy target. It's very uh, powerful. But it's a moderate check. And it's a moderate check because it's not sufficient just to look at the path. You've got to know what, if you didn't know that this inheritance problem even existed, you look at the path and you say, well, there's nothing wrong with that path. There's just the path. The other part of the problem here is that um, <clears throat> you can specify the templates or startup path to be a network path. Now think about that. I want to have a template 
sitting on the server. Every time I load Word, this template it goes out and gets this template. Well, it gets it from the network. Well, let's take a modification of that case. Let's say I'm the attacker and I want you to get my template. One thing I can do is um, set up a rogue host. I'm going to set up this rogue host and I'm going to share my whole file system with the world. I don't care, it's cheap. I'm by 486, copy 95. And all I need to do is get your template directory structured to point to a network path. Now when you, now maybe I send you a document, maybe I can do this, maybe I tell you to surf to a web page. Now what happens is when you open the document that I give you, Word goes out and seeks out this template actively. So if it's a network resource, all of a sudden you've got packets flying over the network. And if you've got a clear connection, i.e. there's no firewall or mediating thing that would stop the transaction between the client and server, now you have a template sitting on a row host macro virus scanner on your system is never going to see it because it never was on your system. But Word's going to go get it. Word's going to load it automatically. And because it's a template, there will be no macro virus detection. Now, the first thing I tried was this slash slash host because that's the Microsoft way. What gets even worse, I didn't know this, but the reason I came across it was because of my Unix background. I'm very comfortable dealing with IP. So I said, well, hey, let me just try this. Slash, slash, IP address. You know, slash, slash, host gets you into the local area network. Slash, slash, IP address gets you into the internet. So now, you've got a web server. The guy's got a document called, uh, I don't know, Seagate. Model 32150 drive specs. Dot doc. Dot doc, right. <laughs> but he doesn't show you the dot doc, he just shows you the spec. And now you go out and you, you get the file. File's based on some template, maybe on his, on his machine, maybe it's somewhere else. Uh, as soon as you open it, boom. As long as there's network access, you can get the file. Uh, and because. And because Word or Office or NT products are so uh, performance driven, you don't notice any difference. It takes the same amount of time. You see the same delay when you open a document on Decolon as it does maybe some network path. So you're used to seeing the delays. Microsoft has conditioned you to see the, the delays, accept them. When you open a document, get a real, get, take like a 30 page document, open it up, and scroll all the way down the bottom as fast as you can. Right? What happens? The screen kind of just. Because what it's doing is it's loading just enough for you to see the screen. And then while you start to do your work, it's loading in the other pages. So they've got you perfectly conditioned to accept the way that you might encounter over some network connection. Here's a validation experiment you can try. Now make sure when you do this experiment that macro virus protection is turned on. The whole premise of this macro virus protection thing was it's supposed to protect you. But we've already demonstrated if you set your paths such a way, then you can get around it. So make sure that the make sure that your macro virus protection is on. Create a word document and put a macro in it. And put it in uh, you know somewhere on your system. Then close the close the document and reopen it. Now what you should see, this is Office 97. What you should experience is, hey, this document has macros. Do you want to open it? You can click whatever answer you like. 
But then go in, and I would suggest also at this point, go back in and verify the macrovirus detection is on. And then go into tools, option, file locations, and set your work group template to C call backslash. Close the document, reopen it. Now what happened? If things are structured the way I am suggesting, you should not see any macrovirus detection whatsoever. And then just say to yourself, what if that was an auto-open? Okay, so I'm moving to a new topic, structured storage. Structured storage is the transport mechanism for macroviruses. It's set up again like it is like a file system, but within the context of a file. So storage is in streams, and storage is like a directory, and streams like a file. And um, this is part of OLE, Object le Linking and Embedding. And the, the premise is, you know, um, there's all these different types of programs out there. We all have to manage different pieces and, uh, and objects. So why not take the file system approach, put them all in a container that we can all agree on a format, structured storage, and manipulate that, taking out those things that you need to do your operations as, a, as an application. Now there's some advantages to structured storage. It's, it's a little more efficient. Well, it's efficient and it's inefficient. Um, it's, in, it's efficient in the sense that you have all these things in one space and you don't have to have duplicate copies for each application. You don't have to have a file for each object. You can put them all in one. It's inefficient because uh, you have to do things like fragmentation and file allocation within the file. So there's going to be times you should try another experiment. Do a document, do like 10 edits on it, get, get it up to about 150K, and then do a file save as. What you'll see happening is over time, you do this 10 or so times, the file will grow and grow and grow. And you do file save as, and then you, you have a new file, and it's really short. It's short because each time you're editing the document, it's allocating new space, and it allocates it in blocks. And so it's, it's not touching anything that's already in there, it's just allocating more. But when you do a file save as, it does a clean sweep and it compacts everything. So the, the, my point here of interrogation of the container, it's actually a, a distinct point, is that um, the advantage here is, you know, I can write an application and I can present a specification of what my application does. And some other vendor could write a tool which goes in at like the document summary information. If you take Explorer and you right click a file, you do properties, you see sometimes they'll have a summary tab. That's because the container associated with that file has structured storage in it. And so Explorer can go and interrogate all your files on your system and bring back the summary information which is contained in them. Because it's a distinct entity within the document and it's identifiable and, and locatable. So that's an advantage because, you know, Let's say I want to find the report that I wrote 10 years ago, and I wrote it with Gene, and we were working for Arca Systems at the time. Well, if you fill out those summary forms, you could actually go in and find that. You would define the command. Let's see. Uh, <coughs> disadvantage, of course, the main one I see is there's just another layer of abstraction here. NT is already, the user is so far away from the kernel now that uh, it's really hard for somebody new coming into, you know, the computing environment to just really see what's going on down there. And every time we add a layer to it, you're just farther and farther away from what's happening. And that means the attackers are getting more and more ways to 